This week on Spoke TV, Kathleen Wynn visited Conestoga College's Cambridge campus to talk with students about future projects and current achievements. It's really very impressive and uh, inspirational. And we look at one local athlete who defeats all odds. And she's dedicated and she's very, very adamant about becoming a very good curler. Plus, Conestoga College students take an icy dip in the pool for a good cause. Honestly, it's a, it's a so much fun. The energy here is fantastic. And welcome to Spoke TV, Conestoga College's weekly news show produced by second year journalism students. I'm Varsha Sri Ganesh. And I'm Mike Stromey. The Premier of Ontario, Kathleen Wynne, visited Conestoga College along with Ontario's Minister of Advanced Education, Mitzi Hunter. Tushar said he was on the tour. On February 15th, Conestoga College Cambridge campus welcomed Premier of Ontario Kathleen Wynne. The President of Conestoga College, John Timbits, greeted her and introduced her to students' work. Very impressive. So we want to show her, um, you know, really reinforce the fact that a lot of the good things that are going on in the college and how strong our students really are. The Premier had a look at BIA, which is an off-road vehicle prototype built by engineering students. Our students who ran that car or raced it came first in Ontario. They, they beat all the universities and all the other colleges, so that's a big achievement. Kathleen Wynn was here at Conestoga College, Cambridge campus, where she talked to students about the future projects and their achievements. She was accompanied by Mitzi Hunter. They both took a tour of the campus and interacted with faculty as well. Wynn had one-on-one -on -one interaction with interior designing students and asked them to show their work. The Premier talked about the benefits of a college education. It is an excellent place that uh, students are getting a terrific education and really practical experience that is going to stand them in very good stead when they go out into the world. It's really very impressive and uh, inspirational. Ontario's Minister of Advanced Education, Mitzi Hunter, saw students work and inspired them for future. For Spoke TV, I am Tushar Sethi. Thanks Tushar. The population in Waterloo Region continues to grow. The population in Waterloo Region has taken another step forward in growth. According to the latest census in metropolitan areas provided by Stats Canada, the Waterloo Region saw a 5.5% growth in population between 2011 and 2016. The growth is the 14th largest amongst Canadian cities that, tra that trailed only Guelph, Oshawa and Toronto for the fastest growing among cities in the province. The national median growth in the country over this period was 5%. Equine therapy is an increasingly popular form of treatment, but when one Guelph area horse trainer tried to bring a small horse as a therapy pet to her West End home, the city of Guelph had other plans. Spoke TV's Marty Young has more. Amy Lalon starts her daily equine therapy session. Today is extra special because her horse Odin is here to stay. Lalon suffers from PTSD and has found solace in training the little horse that caused a big problem with the city of Guelph. So I was talking to the head of bylaw and I, I got an email, I emailed him and I got a response saying that it was okay to go ahead and then just before we bought him, I, would, I emailed again and said, is, are there any um, forms I need to fill out? Is there anything I need to do before I get him? We're gonna go get him this weekend and, or he's gonna be delivered this weekend and I was assured, no, there's nothing else that needs to be done and then, Literally the week, like the day we got him, I had Bylaw and the Humane Society show up and I showed them the emails and everything was okay. And then just like week by week, I had about one visit a week from some city official. We had child services, fire marshal, um, OSPCA and Humane Society came a few times. Um, Bylaw, it was crazy for like about one person every week would show up and have some kind of investigation that they needed to do. A neighbor stops by to congratulate her. Glad to hear you got your permission oh, to keep them. And the lawn is grateful oh, yeah. that Odin yeah. is Beautiful finally horse. hers. I just, I don't know, I, it's, it's hard to describe. It's just, I'm, I get to be a person again. <laughs> For Spoke TV in Guelph, I'm Marty Young. <laughs>
For those struggling with mental health, a Waterloo-based company called Passkit offers a kit to support those struggling with anxiety. Spoke TV's Jason Asa reports on more. Developer of the pass kit, Tina Chen had the initial focus of students in mind as she herself experiences stress. When Tina was a University of Waterloo student and experienced depressive symptoms, instead of letting it get her down, it gave her an idea for a mental health kit to help people cope with anxiety. So I definitely had some depressive symptoms and that inspired me to also seek out other people with these lived experiences to um, just like see what the story was around mental health on campus and that really inspired me to uh, also continue on with the product. The pass kit comes with a stress star, earplugs, sleeping mask, a pack of gum, and a deck of 25 cards that have positive thoughts to lift your stress away. It can be purchased at mypasket.com. Mental health affects one in five people, but platforms like Bell Let's Talk and Passkit are trying to end the stigma. According to the Passkit website, only 49% of Canadians will socialize with a friend with a serious mental illness, and 22% of teens will consider suicide this year, and two in three people suffer in silence. Us as a company, we like to provide some informal help as well, so something that's less stigmatizing to access, such as like the kid or just like having a conversation with your friends. And I think that we'd like to improve that by one, decreasing the stigma and uh, improving awareness through events that we uh, participate in, and two, making more products like this that people can access without going through like the wait time. Also, the kit was made to always emphasize the urgency to treat trauma, but wants to do the same for mental health to bring an awareness to mental illness symptoms that we can't notice and give people the items they need to relax. Tanya Young, a student services worker, talks about how students can use basic tools to relax. Really good at um, talking about it. The founder Chen also wants to spark change with the past kit to educate and inform with the goal in mind of spelling myths about mental illness and how people are living with mental illness to allow for better recovery and the quality of life. Rachel Thompson, colleague of Tina Chen, focused on mental health as it affected her personality. But Tina fully takes the time to understand it and understand her users. I think that's why the past kit is different because Tina and her team have kind of lived through it firsthand and then also done a lot of research to make sure that what they're promoting and including in their product is relevant um, for their age demographic. Thompson talks about how Passkit is beneficial to users when they can't attend a doctor's appointment. It's another tool that can help them through the day while they wait to see a professional. So having this tool to use kind of in between those sessions or if they can't make it, I know firsthand has been impactful. Um, so I definitely believe in the efficacy of the Passkit. And that there are certain triggers that would make them um, react to the previous trauma that they've had before. So with our kit, especially our flashcards, um, it was a very good tool to have um, on their person to remind them like what can they do when they do experience that stress that they've experienced before. For mental health, it may be troubling to get support, but Passkit is always accessible and easy to carry. It can help you through tough times. For Spoke TV, I'm Jason Asa. Thanks, Jason. Who says you need to see to curl? A group called the KW Blind Curlers, located in the heart of Waterloo, are proving this theory wrong. Curling, a sport that lets you see and throw a rock to the center with a stick. But what happens if you can't see? The KW Granite Club is home to a 35-year-old group called the KW Blind Curlers. These visually impaired curlers are being taught and getting prepared for provincial and national championships. Head coach Jeff Antonovich has been teaching the KW Blind Curlers for about six years now. I love teaching them because of the fact that it's great gratification. The visually impaired people don't consider it a handicap. They consider it just a speed bump and they have such enthusiasm and dedication. When it comes to visually impaired curling, obstacles are crossed with motivation and hard work, says the coach. Deborah Sampson, a curler with zero vision, has been curling for seven years now. But when I started curling, um, I had some sight. But now the last four years, my sight has completely gone and it's more challenging now having no sight curling because you have to be set up properly and you have to get, the hardest part is to get a feel of how hard to slide the rock. She was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, retinitis, RP they call it, which is, starts out as tunnel vision and then eventually the vision uh, uh, goes on. Yeah. So that's how it starts out. RP is a rare genetic disorder that involves loss or breakdown of cells in the retina. The common symptoms are difficulty at seeing at night and loss of sight. Retinitis starts at an early age, uh -huh. but slowly uh, the, tunnel, the tunnel gets smaller. Uh, as you get older, your vision slowly goes down. 
It's such a gradual process. She says that being visually impaired has not stopped her from coming in every Friday morning at 10 o'clock to the Granite Club to practice. Well, Deborah, as you know, she's totally blind and she's dedicated and she's very, very adamant about becoming a very good curler. And her husband Bob is a very good instructor helping her out, leading her down the ice and getting her all lined up properly. Deborah says that she has learned a few tricks in her journey. I curl with a stick and my coach sets me up and curling with a stick, uh, you get your balance better with the stick. Bob Sampson, the ice director for the KW Curlers, helps coach his wife, Deborah. I think she's doing a wonderful job. She's been doing it, as she said, about seven years. The head coach doesn't see a lot of difference between sighted and a visually impaired curler. Visually impaired people, they like to throw the rock just as well as and efficiently as a sighted person. Curling has become a passion for Deborah. So what do you think? Do you enjoy today? Uh, very much so. I didn't think it would end so quickly. Now Deborah is working her way up to provincial championships and one day, hopefully, the Olympics. For Spoke TV, I'm Varsha Shri Ganesh. And here's Mike Stromi with a look at sports. Over in Pyeongchang, the Canadian women's hockey team fell short in the gold medal game to the Americans 3-2 in a shootout. This marks the first time since 1998 that the Canadian Women's National Hockey Program has finished an Olympic Games with anything less than gold. The Canadian men's curling team lost to the Americans 5-3 in the semifinals in the semifinal match. This marks the first time that the men's team has missed the Olympic finals in, comp in Olympic competition since the sport was reintroduced back in 1998. Canada will compete for bronze versus Switzerland on February 23rd. In the overall medal standings, Canada currently sits third with nine gold, seven silver, and eight bronze, bringing their total to 24. In other sports, the red-hot Toronto Maple Leafs look for their seventh win in their last eight against the New York Islanders on February 22nd. The Eastern Conference leading Toronto Raptors make their return to the, from, make their post All-Star break return against Milwaukee on February 23rd, and your Kitchener Rangers look to add to their Midwest Division lead as they host Sudbury on February 23rd. With a preview of what's to come next month on the hardwood, we turn things over to Spoke TV insider Jason Asa for a look at the big college basketball tournament next month. Jason, thanks for joining us. It's, it's good, nice to be here. Jason, what are, what are some keys to, Jason, what are some keys to making a bracket that won't bust as much as it should? Well, I, I advise people if they're, they're going to do a bracket, focus on teams that, ha that is Michigan State, or a Duke Blue Devil with Tom Izzo, the experienced, and, and Coach K, that, because they have more experience in the tournament and they understand the format. So if you want to, that's, that's the best way to keep your bracket alive. Or you can, uh, or I advise you to look at the bracket and the breakout players and Mikel Bridges and, and Jalen Brunson from Villanova that are a Trey, a Trey Young-like player for, that can, take the team to a deep run in the um, playoffs. Now you mentioned that there, some of the power teams this year are teams like Villanova, Michigan State, Virginia, you mentioned Oklahoma with that power forward in Trey Young. Um, do any of these teams have upset potential? Uh, yes, actually. Um, the, the one team for Villanova, uh, Villanova has a big upset potential because they can't, they can't guard the paint as well as, uh, as a Michigan State team. So I would say, like, a, a since if, if Villanova would face Cincinnati, they would, they, they, Cincinnati might beat them because Cincinnati's ranked uh, at number two in, the, in defense efficiency. So, yes, there's Villanova is one. Uh, Duke, Duke m might be uh, an upset potential if they don't get a nice start in their conference championship. Now, generally speaking, what do successful teams do well in March to lead them to the Final Four? Well, they, uh, they, need, they focus on just one, on winning one game at a time and not overthinking their expectations, especially when a big school like Michigan State or a Virginia or Virginia Tech, because when, when, when those schools, they overthink stuff, they, it gets in their head and then they, and then they lose to a, a Middle Tennessee or a South Carolina, what just happened last year like with Duke. So they just need to focus on one, just focus on one game to uh, just take it one game at a time. Yeah, one, yeah, game, at one time. game at a time. Now, before the big March Madness tournament, each conference has their own 
playoff tournaments. Um, you have the ACC tournament, the uh, the SEC tournament, et cetera, et cetera. How much um, how much does momentum play from those tournaments leading into March Madness? I think it plays a big important role for the, for the Big East Conference and the ACC because those are the conferences that are trying to look for the most uh, proven because of the to the two leagues that have the uh, the kind of the best teams in the in the in the nation so they have more riding on what they they need to win so i think by them if villanova or a cincinnati would win and in their conference and think it would give them a little bit more edge over a team a team like uh, kentucky or kansas because they have a little bit more advantage yeah. Obviously, we have the Power Five conferences. You know, you have your Pac-12s, your ACCs, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Is there a team from a lesser-known conference that we really need to look forward, look out for come March? Yes, uh, you need to look out for Cincinnati Bearcats. They are one of the one of the um, biggest threats under under Coach um, Mick Cornell. He, his team is rolling at the right time at the in this in this conference. They've been taking out teams like uh, and Seton Hall, so and and they had a close battle with Wichita State. So I think they're the team that they can uh, push for a national championship. All right, I'm going to ask you one more question before yeah. we get out of here, and it's uh, I think it's a question that's on a lot of people's minds. Who do you have? I mean, mind you, it's way too early. We're still in February as as it stands right now. But who's your way too early Final Four? Yeah, uh, my way too early final is Virginia Cavaliers, uh, Duke Boo Devils, Michigan State Spartans, and Villanova Wildcats. But that's too early, so I don't know. But I have Virginia Cavaliers winning the championship. Ooh, that's nice. They have a, I heard they have a really strong defense. Yeah, this and year, I, so. it'll be kind of nice for, and for Tony Bennett to win uh, his first national championship in the, at that program because they haven't won it for and for 29 years, so, wow, that's, so that that's, program and that thing will boost in recruiting. That's, that's, quite, uh, that's quite a journey. Uh, Jason, thank you for joining us, and uh, best of luck in all of your brackets, and hopefully the viewers can uh, take a little bit of uh, what you've said um, and apply it to their own brackets. Oh, thanks for being on your show. Yeah, thank you. Last week, CSI hosted their annual Polar Plunge here on campus, so I went to check things out. On February 15th, Conestoga College students jumped into freezing water marking the 37th annual Polar Plunge. The event was organized by CSI, that is Conestoga Students Incorporated. Porter Olson, member of Board of Directors for CSI, and Bulldo, Executive Director of KW Habilitation, and Miss Oktoberfest 2017, Michaela Umbridge were the judges. Oh, uh, it feels great. Honestly, it's a it's a so much fun. The energy here is fantastic. Uh, everyone is is coming in their biggest costumes with their biggest smiles and making some pretty big jumps too. So it's great. Umbridge said her standard outfit was the Ice Cube Man, who had a blue beard and got decked out wearing a full homemade Ice Cube box. All the funds raised will go to KW Habilitation, a non-profit organization enriching lives of children and adults with developmental disabilities. This year, there were prizes for the best costume, best splash and biggest donation. CSI likes to get involved as much as we can. Uh, we are looking to make a goal of $2,500 this year. Uh, we have some food services uh, inside. After the cold plunge, CSI provided warm towels, food and coffee to the participants. Dave Rocks 107.5 were the hosts for the event. Special guests included CTV reporters Mark Vianama and Tyler Caver, who also took the plunge. Uh, incredibly painful at the start. Um, the shock and awe, you're not really prepared for it. You think you're prepared for it, but once you get out of the water, the first thing on my mind was drying off. The plunge is sponsored by numerous businesses in and around the area. For Spoke TV, I'm Varsha Shri Ganesh. Well, Mike, I didn't see you at the event. Where were you? Well, Varsha, um, I was pl honestly, it looked really interesting, especially that one guy who uh, just kind of belly flopped in there. I would be that guy, but unfortunately, I had to be back in the newsroom and prepare for last week's show of uh, Spoke TV. I did sneak down and grab some of the refreshments, though. They were, uh, they were quite tasty. Nice. Well, next year, I think you should definitely make it. Uh, I won't be here next year, but hopefully I'll find some sort of avenue to jump in. And that's something I've wanted to do for years. So unfortunately, I didn't get to do it this year, but uh, maybe in the future. Nice. Well, that's all we have for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Varsha Shri Ganesh. And I'm Mike Stromi. For more news and information, check us out at spoketv.ca and follow us on Twitter at spoketv.